Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Categorically Romance Podcast. My name is Bree, and I am joined by the one and only Tara Taylor Quinn today. I am so happy you're here. Like, you were one of the first guests to join Sarah and I way back in the day on the podcast. So thank you for joining me. We are recording this, like, kind of late into January. How has 2024 started for you? Oh, it's starting really good. <clears throat> really good. I have... um you know, I, I love what I do. Writing is my life and I've got lots on my plate in that area. So lots of exciting things happening. So life is good. That is one thing that I find really inspiring by you. So I, I, I'm so happy that you said that because it kind of leads into what I wanted to chat with you about next. Like you have this kind of amazing outlook on like I have a lot of things on my plate and I feel like in a world where we're constantly talking about how like we're overwhelmed, I feel like you're the bright spot that kind of, I don't know, leans into, I have a lot of things on my plate and like, it's not a bad thing. So here's some of the tweets of yours that I've saved. Cause like I said, very inspiring. So the first one that you had uh, that I saved is um, a key to drawing in readers live through your characters rather than making them live through you. Can you talk about that? Yeah, so um, I actually just saw a post from Susan Elizabeth Phillips yesterday um, that exactly said that, um, and that is as as an author. I mean, I, I I have to be careful in how I see it because there are different ways to write, and no way is right and wrong. Okay, for me, I can't do the whole plotting thing um, mm-hmm. because then I'm bossing the characters. Now, I'm not saying everybody that plots bosses their characters because everybody's gift comes to them in different ways, okay? But for me, I go down inside and it's just like this spiritual thing. It's a gift and I can't control it and I don't control the people. I just go down inside and I let them tell me their stories. In other words, I let other people live and make choices different than I might make for them, but it's their choices, So just, um, I always see every side of the story, which makes it, you know, in life in general, and that makes, it makes living sometimes really hard because people want you to make choices. And I, I can't always do that because I see both sides of the story, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and for my people, it's like, I don't see any sides of the story. They tell me the story. I just, I don't control them. I don't. You're the scribe. You're yeah, the scribe. I, I am. I am. And and when I try to control them, the book doesn't work. Wow. You know. And I'm. I then I'm like, I can't. Nothing's coming to me. And you know. Then I step back and go, okay, get out of your own way and let them tell you their story. And then it comes, and there it goes. <laughs> Has that always been your mentality, or is that something you grew into? It's. It's always been, it's me. See, and I, and I think that's why I always say, as long as I'm writing, I'm okay. I I was born a writer and I know that sounds crazy, but that's absolutely true. Um, I started writing when I was, I wrote my first story when I was in kindergarten and it was put in the school newspaper, um, first, first grade, first grade yeah. school newspaper. Um, I just have always heard stories in my head, you know, and, and it's just who I am. I mean, they, I just always have stories in my head. <laughs> so. Yeah. Well, that leads into the next tweet of yours. I saved it was, uh, I really love this one. Everything in life becomes story. Pay attention. Talk about that. So life is hard when you're at life is hard in general, I think, but when you're an emotionally um, sensitive person, like I am, everything comes at you and you take it in. And I think that's another part of me um, being that scribe is I take in everything. And so much of it, I feel emotionally, Um, you know, it's like an empathic thing, not to get all woo woo, but it really is. And I believe it because I live it. Um, I, everything I hear. So everything I absorb in goes into the mix of what comes out. And I don't ever know, I don't, consciously knowingly do it but my mom she reads all my books she used to work for me and she reads all my books and she's always saying well I knew what they were going to pull out of that bag or (laughs) I knew what kind of pie was coming out of the oven or oh I knew what you know she recognizes I don't know it when it goes onto the page but she recognizes things she says every single book I she reads of mine she recognizes different things throughout the book so 
but it's also sometimes it's conscious in that, like um, I heard a story, I read a story in the news about a family in Florida who had gone on vacation and their van was hijacked and only one person lived. And that just, I just kept thinking about it. And that was so, it upset me so much. Like I woke up in the night upset about it. And so I had to write a happy ending. It became a story. And um, it was released by special edition um, last year. It was called Reluctant Roommates. And, um, and it was the story of she's grown and how it was a, in my book, it was, she was a, a young girl with her parents and her grandfather. And, and in my book, and she hid under the van and everyone else was killed, but she lived. Well, that none of that comes out in the special edition, only in that it's her backstory. Mm -hmm. But um, the whole book was about this woman and how it had affected her. And um, she's a very positive person and how she lives life, but she didn't know that, that, that she had shut things off because that's what happened inside me, you know, when I was living the story. So um, that's just one example. But a lot of times it's whatever affects me deeply comes out in the books. Well, another one I saved was three projects due by February. I wake up in the morning happy the pages are waiting for me. Find your passion, make it work, and you live your best life. And I think this kind of goes back to when you're like, you know, I have a lot on my plate. Mm -hmm. Uh, But you have such an amazing outlook on, I have a lot on my plate. Where does that, I mean, I mean, you you said you were born a writer and I believe it. I wholeheartedly believe it. How do you maintain that mindset? How do you not let it overwhelm you? Okay. So, I mean, I have, I'm not perfect. And I do have moments where um, it doesn't so much overwhelm me as I do get tense sometimes. Mm -hmm. Um, But I get tense when, you know, lunch I have to eat and I don't want to stop, you know, or, oh my gosh, I have to wrap presents and I really want to, I need to get these pages done. You know, I get tense about things like that, but then I also have learned, I I don't know, through my whole life, you take one thing at a time and don't worry about the rest while you're doing that one thing. And for me, it comes back to, I've always known I wanted to be a writer. You know, I was 14 when I started telling everybody I was going to write for Harlequin. I had gotten a free copy of a Harlequin romance at the grocery store checkout, and I was hooked. And I knew that was who I needed to be. And in college, you know, majored in English and honor society. And, you know, the dean of the English school of English was my mentor. And I'm telling him and he's telling me, no, all these things I need to do with my life. And I said, and, you know, and about he said, I need to use my talent to write literature and, you know, change the world. And after I sold my first book to Harlequin and I sent it to him after it came out, I sent it to him and I told him, I said, you know, your definition of literature was that a book talks about the mores of the times and shows people in future generations what it was like living in those times. And, um, and a book talks about people and real lives. And so I asked him to read the book and tell me what he thought. And um, I said, you tell me, this is not real re- literature. And he read the book in one sitting and said, okay, I'm convinced. I'm convinced. So the thing about that is I'm incredibly lucky that I have always known who I am and what what my life's purpose is. Mm-hmm. And when you can get to that place, that doesn't mean there aren't things in life. I mean, I get hurt, you know, I definitely, people have done things to me that hurt me and I have to deal with them. It doesn't mean life's perfect, but it means every day I get to get up and do what I love. And you know, you know how you love to read books. I've heard you talk so much about getting lost in this book and that book. And when I'm writing, it's that, it's that feeling on steroids truthfully, because I'm a reader too. And when you're writing, it's all of that plus. It's just, I love it. I, I look forward to it. And so, yes, I've got all these deadlines, but I'm so thankful to have them because so many people want to do what I do and they don't have that opportunity. But even more than that, I remember that 14 year old girl yes. and, and I am, I'm doing it. I I get to do it. I just feel so incredibly lucky. 
And so that's, that's what I think about, you know, what if I didn't get to do this? Yeah. Then I just can't. So it's twofold. It's that I I'm doing what I get to do. I get to do what I want most to do, but also when I'm in the book, I love it so much. So, you know, kind of on an aside to that, my husband for many years worked in a a job that he was trained to do and he was good at and he didn't mind it, but it was a job. Right. And I finally told him, you know, no, if you can do something, because there was, there was something else he loved to do. He loves working with his hands and building things and, um, you know, building rooms and doing renovations and that kind of stuff. And I said, okay, so do it, you know, do it, quit, quit your, there you are in your office doing what you are good at, but do what you love. And now he owns his own home repair business, you know, oh. and he does what he loves. And that's what matters. It's, it's a small business, but it does well. It does very well. Um, he could grow it, but he doesn't, he doesn't want to be that executive anymore. He yeah. wants to do what he loves doing. And, and that's, to me, that's, if, if I could give any message to anybody, follow what you love, you know, follow your heart and do what you love. And that's what I do. Well, knowing that you have like all these stories in your head all the time. And when you say like, okay, I'm on a deadline for kind of multiple projects at once. We, on the other hand, on the other side of it, we see like last year was crazy. I was like, okay, we have a lot of TTQ books coming out. And then this year I'm like, I think it's like the first three or four months of this year, we have like a new release from you. When you have these multiple projects, these multiple characters that are like, all right, Tara, here we are. This is, this is what we need from you. How are you juggling that? Like what is kind of the behind the scenes of, I have a lot on my plate right now look like, like, how are you managing it? Okay. So I don't ever write two books at once. Okay. Not ever. And they, my people get their time and I live with them. Um, I, I, no matter what I'm doing, when I'm in a book, I'm in a book. So my husband and I are, you know, driving out to eat and all the way to the restaurant, the people are talking to me or, you know, I mean, it's just, I live this stuff. I feel it like my characters feel it. So I can't do more than one at a time. However, I am extremely prolific. So I think really fast and I type even faster. So I type about as fast as I think really. Um, And so it only takes me Um, if I can just be down in uninterrupted, it'll take me four or five weeks to write a book. But wow. that said, um, I mean, I write seven days a week and usually 10 hours a day because once I'm down in first place, because I love it so much. I mean, there's, I, it's what I love to do, but, um, you know, you get to choose what you want to do. That's what I want to do. Um, but also because I live these people. And I'm so deep into them that it's not even, it's, it's disruptive to me to go in and out, you know? Okay. So like that makes me irritable or it's, it just makes me feel like I'm, I'm not, I'm not healthy in those times. If I have to go in and out, it's like, you know, asking you to, um, be in four different relationships at once with four different men when you love your husband, you know, you, and I mean, that's a bad analogy because I write romance and I'm not in relationships with these people, but it's that emotional pull, you know, I can't, I I'm with these people now. I can't go over there. Um, that said, there's a lot to writing a book besides the actual creation. And so I've got, um, like this month alone, I have a book, I had a book due January 10th and I have a book due February 15th. Um, that one's a little close. So I had planned the entire month just to be in that book, ended up having to write four proposals and I had art facts due that I didn't know about and a line edit due that I didn't know about. So Thankfully, my editor is fabulous, and um, you know, we worked out the timing so that I could get everything done. I took last week, and I wrote the four proposals. I did the line edit. I did the art fact sheet, and now I'm uninterrupted until February 15th. Wow. So, yeah, so I'm like in my zone right now. I get to just spend my days with these people. And, and, you know, I, like I said, when you read a book, you know, and you get so into it, well, when you're writing the book, it's 
it's always like the type of stuff I like to read because that's what's coming out of me, right? It's yeah. not like I'm going to pick up a bad book. I get to do, it's just the stories that I love and they just pour out and entertain me and, mm -hmm. you know. Well, I love that you said that because my final tweet that I saved that I wanted to chat with you about is write something you believe in. If you don't believe it, your reader won't either. Right. Because then it's stale. I mean, you have to, even if you're not, I mean, I write emotional stuff, you know, um, emotion is, is me, but even if you're writing nonfiction, if you don't believe it, it, that it's not going to live for the people reading what you're writing. You know, I, I don't want to get into AI, but because I'm on a bunch of committees and it's, it's a thing, you know, but, mm -hmm. um, the one thing I do want to say about the whole AI thing is there is no emotion in that, right? No, so, right. So a computer can regurgitate and it can regurgitate emotional, sen you know, sentences that have emotion in them, but there's no life in it. And, and I think uh, any author I've ever read, in order to grip the reader and pull the reader in there has got to be life in that writing there has to be and at least anything i've ever seen anything i've known anything i've heard and i've been to you know 30 years worth of writing conventions and reader conventions and and if there's no life it it doesn't it doesn't grip so i love that your sierra's web series is both in special edition and the romantic suspense line. Was that how you planned it? Was that your hope for it? That was, so that was kind of a funny thing. Um, I had come up with the idea. I had a meeting in New York with the senior editor of Special Edition and the senior editor of Romantic Suspense and um, my overall like business editor at Harlequin. Um, and she doesn't edit books anymore, but she is overall on my career. And so the three of us sat down for this meeting and in my head, I had come up with the series and I really wanted it to come out in both lines. And so I suggested it at the meeting and, um, you know, to my benefit, they all three loved the idea and went with it. So that actually just came from a suggestion from me and they went with it and here we go. So creatively for you, what, um, what are you enjoying about writing in writing this series, but being able to dip your toe in like both of these lines that you love, you love writing for? So it's really important to me. I used to write for Super Romance back when um, Harlequin had that line and Super Romance was basically a combination of um, romantic suspense and special edition because it did both suspense and non-suspense. So that's who I first sold to and that's who I grew up with. And, and it's what I need because I, I've got suspense, I've got the darkness, I've got the, and not even just darkness, but that, you know, the, on the edge of your seat, hold your breath. Oh my gosh, going into danger. But at the same time, I need the sunshine and the flowers and the, and the kids and the, just straight relationship conversations. I love those conversations that are deep emotional relationship conversations between hero and heroine. And I need to be able to do that. And so I wanted a series where I could, I could be like in super romance where I'm, I'm being both parts of myself. And I, I go back and forth between the two because that's what keeps me healthy. It keeps me emotionally and mentally healthy to be able to, you know, go back and forth. That said, I'm actually doing a new series in special edition. It comes out, um, this the first book comes out in November of this year. Um, and it's called The Cottages on Ocean Breeze. Oh my and, gosh. And I love this series. The book I'm writing right now is the third book in the series. And I love this series so much. I just have to say it's wonderful. It's I'm still doing Sierra's Web. Um mm -hmm. But I'm doing this this new series for special edition, you know, because we've gone to longer books and um, which I love. Super romance was longer. I'm used to doing. I was thinking that when I chatted with Susan and she's like, yeah. you know, it's going up. And I was like, oh, I bet Tara Taylor Quinn is going to just knock this out of the park because her super yeah. romance days. Yep. I love it. I love it. So when Gail, when Gail told me about it, I was, she goes like, I know you're the one person that's really going to be happy about this. Gail. <laughs> uh, 
Gail Chasen does the, um, she's the senior editor for special edition. And so when she was telling me about it, she goes, I know you're one that's going to be happy about this. And I really, really am so happy about it, but because it lets me go deeper, you know, into all the emotional aspects of relationships. Um, but the cottages on ocean breeze is, um, just something that came to me because I, it was someplace I wish existed and I wanted to be. It's set outside of San Diego and it used, there used to be this big, um, luxury hotel that was set up on a cliff that overlooked the ocean. You know, I don't know how familiar you are with California, but there are along the coastline, there are places where you can't actually get to the water because there's a cliff above and kind of like cliffs around it, you know, so you mm -hmm. can't, you can't, it's, it's sharp cliffs that are straight down and they're like kind of rock. And, um, so I've got this hotel that was set up there, but this hotel overlooks a section of private beach that is surrounded by these, co it's like in a cove of cliffs, this beach is. And you can't access it from the water because of coral reefs. So you've got this beach. So they did this luxury hotel and then they did a private drive down the, cut it into the mountain, down to the down to the beach and they built cottages down there and it's a two mile stretch and the cottages are all on over, uh, on an acre and a half of land and the rich and famous could go down there and vacation so um now you move ahead the hotel went out of business and for whatever reason and the cottages went into disrepair and somebody bought them and they're renovating them and it's all these um, people are buying these cottages. It's a, this two mile stretch of private beach and their cottages are on the beach. And so it's just, I can do two miles worth of stories here. I and, want to be in this place. Okay. And <laughs> it's, it's just so phenomenal. I just love it so much because one of the things is um, uh, several of the characters have dogs. Um, I'm a huge dog whisperer and um, have never been without a dog since I was 13. And um, so a lot of my people have dogs and dogs are actually becoming characters um, more and more in my books, like main characters, like they actually play a part. They're not just, you know, there and being cute. Mm -hmm. And um, and so on Ocean Breeze, several of the um, cottage owners have dogs and the dogs can run on the beach because, you know, it's like natural fencing all the way around. And so it's like this, it's become like this dog club down there where all the dogs get along and the, you know, there's, there's some service dogs, there's just some pets, but it's, it's really fun. And I've got it where um, the person who bought Ocean Breeze, who bought the cottages on Ocean Breeze, um, it renovated some to sell. Some of them are still not renovated and you can either buy them and, you know, have them renovated or you can buy it and renovate it yourself. So it left me lots of options for, you know, who comes along and what you want to do. Um, I'll give you one little tidbit is the person that bought the cottages has a free story coming out on Harlequin um, in May for Mother's Day. It's a, I, I wrote a, it's a pre, it's a prequel to the series because the first book doesn't come out till November, but um, in May for Mother's Day, Harlequin is doing a free read online that is the story of the person who bought Ocean Breeze. Oh my so, gosh. But nobody who lives there knows that she owns the cottages. So she, you know, she's kind of mentioned in the stories a little bit so far. Um, she's mentioned, she was not mentioned in book one um, because that was just setting, you know, that was letting readers, bringing readers into Ocean Breeze. Um, so, you know, because my, my books are about the story itself, not so much about all of the background. Um, but she's mentioned briefly in book two and she'll be mentioned a little more in book three. And at some point the, the residents are going to know, cause she's just a resident on the beach. Mm. And at some point the residents are going to know, but her story, I love her story so much. And when you read the free read, you understand why she's just a resident on the beach. It's, it's, it's really, really a, 
I, I just love it. I love it so much. So I'm so excited. It sounds yeah. so cozy. <laughs> yeah. So, so excited. It is. And, and, you know, and it's just, it's a lot of young professionals and, um, it, it, it just, it opened the door to me to be able to do anything. And actually the book I'm writing now, um, I, I'm just, it, it's just like flowing. Like I can't type fast enough on this one, um, is the story of a dancer and, you know, forever and ever dancing and sports arts, the art world and sports in general were taboo in category romance because, they just didn't sell. And I don't know why they didn't sell. I never understood why they didn't sell, but they didn't. And now readers are more open to these things. And again, I have no idea why, but they mm-hmm. are. And special edition has not had, um, actually Harlequin category in general has not really done much, if anything, with dancers, the world of dance. And I'm talking um, ballet, modern, you know, um, working dance, like, yeah. The dancers you see behind singers and um, uh, actually a lot of commercials are dancers because they can move on cue and, you know, that kind of stuff. But I and my daughter was a professional dancer. She had an agent in L.A. when she was eight. She just was very, very gifted dancing. And because she was so young, I had to chaperone her everywhere. And so I ended up taking dance classes myself because I had to be there all day and, you know, um, I spent a lot of world, a lot of years in that world and I love the world. And so I asked, could I please do a dancer? And they said, you know what? Yeah, let's try this. So let's try it. Yeah. yeah. So it's, I'm just loving it because she's living on ocean breeze because she needs to have a life separate from the stage and a life where it's not cutthroat and competitive and, you know, and I just, I just love it. I just love it. And the hero um, used to be, you know, male dancers are are not nearly as prevalent. So competition for any female part of anything or even making it, you know, making enough money to make it as a dancer. um, It's it's really hard um, for, for female dancers because, you know, girls love to go to dance class, right? Or their parents want them to go or whatever. It's a thing girls do. Not so much a thing boys do, although they do, but not so much. So, you know, you'll have one guy for a hundred girls at an audition. And so obviously if you're a, a good male dancer, your chances of making money are pretty good. Where for a female, it's, it's, you know, hard, really, really hard. And so you might get one part, but then you're not going to get the next or the next, and then you'll get one. But, you know, it's not enough to support you that way. Um, So my hero was actually his mother owned a dance studio, and he was a male dancer who made it really, really big young, and he did not like what it was doing to him. He, you know, he had all these women all over him and he was breaking hearts and thinking he was so great and he was you know, all about himself. And he had a wake up call and did not like it. And he also realized, you know, he was, a he loved dancing. He did not like being on stage, but he'd been on stage since his mom put him there when he was five, you know, um, she had been a professional dancer. So here's this guy. He's yeah. You know, you're going to hear a little bit of how my life comes out. Here's a guy who was doing what he was good at and he was making good money but he didn't love being on stage. Mm -hmm. He wanted to work with his hands. Oh, so he became a contractor and he designs, he, he, he went to school. And so he does all his own designs and everything. Um, and so he is working on cottages on ocean breeze and my heroine calls him to design a deck for the back of her cottage that will allow different views of the ocean. So it has to be all, you know, like not just a straight deck, right? It's different shapes and it's got this fireplace and it's, it's a lovely deck. And so um, when he comes to talk to her in the initial appointment, she recognizes him. Of course, he doesn't recognize her, but she was only 12 when he was on the circuit. So um, they never actually met, but he thinks at first that, she's somebody whose heart he broke because he, that's all he did. Right. And, um, he's going to leave and whatever, but anyway, that's how the book starts. 
So, you know, she's now this great dancer and she's choreographer for all this different stuff. And she's going to try to get him back on stage, you know, just Mm -hmm. for what he loves, for what he loves, not for, for, not for uh, making money at it. Yeah. So. Oh, this, I am so excited for this series. It sounds, the location sounds wonderful. I can already get that community vibe that we love with special editions so much. And yeah, I'm just, it, it sounds, it sounds really refreshing. I <laughs> just yeah. like the coast, these cottages. I'm, I'm and so the, here for it. And the water, I mean, the ocean comes up to the beach. It's just boats can't get to it. So you know, like at Christmas time on the beach on Ocean Breeze, the, the book coming out in November is a Christmas book. And the whole beach is like picture Disneyland or, you know, some winter wonderland where you drive through with all the lights. The whole beach is that. And they have a candy cane lane that oh. lights up at night. But boats can't come to destroy their privacy, right? Yeah. But boats line up outside, you know, outside the reefs, just outside the reefs, all these people from LA and San Diego, they all come out in houseboats and whatever to be out there and enjoy the the lights on ocean breeze. So it's, it's just fun. Yeah, it's so fun. I can, I can just make it be as emotionally wonderful as I want it to be. So yeah. Well, let's let's chat fortune and name only. So it's book two in the fortunes of Texas mini series, digging for secrets. Um, For anyone who is like new to the fortunes and the world of miniseries, like how would you describe this miniseries that you're you're part of? Okay, um, miniseries in general, I will say um, my husband. I, again, I'm talking about him a lot, but you know he's my husband. Um, he he just said, you know, I've got a trifecta here because I'm actually doing fortunes, Mavericks, and Coltons. Oh my so gosh. Coltons are for, um, for romantic suspense and then the, the Mavericks and the fortunes are special edition. So all three of these series have been going on for close to 30 years. Um, Mavericks have been 30 years for sure. Um, cause this year is their 30th anniversary. Fortunes have been back from the nineties and the Coltons go way back as well. Um, and what this is, is, um, I don't, I, I'm going to use a word that some people take as negative and it's, and it's not, um, but they're kind of like soap operas. So think of all my children that's been going on forever and ever and ever. And the characters grow and change and different families come and people leave and, you know, um, but it's a world viewers who go to all my children, they know that world or one life to live. You know, they know that world used to be something general hospital that my mother used to watch. I never watched it, but man, I remember her. She just had to go, you know, beyond when it was on. Um, that's kind of like what these mini series are. Um, they're a little different with the Coltons. The Coltons are a family. And so now after all these years, you have many, many, many branches of this family. You have cousins and second cousins and third cousins and illegitimate cousins and, you know, and so every year the series revolves around one branch of the Colton genealogy. And, um, you know, as people grow and change and have kids and they have kids and, you know, your family, think about doing your own genealogy. There's never ending branches of your family. So um, that's what the Coltons are and they travel all over and it's, it's romantic suspense and, um, And the Coltons are generally, there's at least somebody who's been in the military or um, detective or some kind of, um, because it's suspense, you know, there's, there's generally some kind of law enforcement or gun carrying, you know, in the Coltons. Um, But they go to different towns. It's different people every year, um, a different branch of the family, and they're all over the United States. But with fortunes and mavericks they're um they're a lot more close-knit um they the fortunes are always in texas they've been you know you'll have many years with the same people in the same town um in mavericks they're always in montana um with the fortunes it's the same family like the coltons Um, and branches of the family. 
so that's where they're like the Coltons, but the Mavericks are like the Coltons and that it's um, different, different families and different people. Um, although you'll see a lot of the same people for several years in a Maverick in the same town, but then it moves to a different town, but it's not all the same family. Like the fortunes and the Coltons are the same family. Mavericks are not. So Mavericks are more Western set. Um, but there are continuing characters like, um, this, there's an older woman, much older now she's in her nineties. Um, who's in the Mavericks and I just love her. She's been in the Mavericks pretty much since Mavericks began. And now in her nineties, she has just gotten married and um, she's a psychic and the people have in Montana have, she used to have this syndicated news column and that people in Montana forever have thought that she's a little bit off her rocker, but truthfully, no, she just has a lot of wisdom and she, she's a great character. You can do so much with her. Um, but the fortunes, um, they are, there's usually money involved. It's, they're fun to write. It's just a feel good for me. Um, there's usually money involved and you can get emotional and it fits, you know, it's, they, it just pulls on the kind of like soap opery heartstrings, except it's not like, oh my gosh, you're going to have a brain transplant or, you know, it's believable stuff. It, it, mm -hmm. It, it pulls on, I mean, it's larger than life in some of the stuff it pulls on, but it actually, you could prove that it could happen, unlike, you know, a brain transplant. Um, I say that because that Joey on Friends, you know, <laughs> that's your papa and <laughs> he yeah. had a brain, a brain transplant. Um, but, but so um, I, the particular, this Fortunes this year, I really, really love this series. And my book, um, Fortune and Name Only, it just was so fun. So it's a marriage of convenience. It's, um, but it's, it's between best friends. So like they both need something and they can both get something out of this marriage, but they don't want to lose their friendship. They don't want to muck it up. They've been, they're, they're, they're best friends. So they decide to get married. Um, and continue to be best friends. And of course, it doesn't quite work that way. But um, and I, I just, I love the book. It has all the emotional pulls on it. She was orphaned. She's a triplet. And she was orphaned when she was a baby and doesn't really, re she has, a, you know, brief flashes. She was like a year and a half or she was very young when she was orphaned. And her two sisters um, are also in the, they have books in the series. One's written by Terry Wilson and one is written by Nancy Robards Thompson. And those are the two sisters. And Nancy's sister was taken in by a woman in a neighboring town and raised by her. And I mean, she's her mother and has a lovely relationship with her. And Terry's, uh, Terry's sister um, was adopted by a wealthy family in town. And my sister just went from foster home to foster home to foster home. And they didn't even know about each. My sister knew about the other two, but the other two didn't know they were triplets until they were 17. Oh my and God. yeah, now my sister knew some things about herself, but she didn't know, you know. But anyway, so they... Um, in this fortune series, um, they've known about each other for, for several years now, but they're still building relationships with each other, you know, so it's, it's really cool. But my sister grew up an orphan and her whole, her only town, her only family was this small town. And so, and she knew her triplet sister, obviously they grew up in a small town, but she didn't know it was her, you know, she did not actually, they didn't know each other till they were 17 because her her uh, sister that lived in near town, it, they were out on a ranch. Um, she went to a private school, so she didn't really know her. But um, but anyway, so it's just, it's a lot of fun. So it's the hero is new to town. Um, this particular fortunes has to do with a branch of the fortune family cousins um, to fortunes in this town. They got notification of an inheritance mm -hmm. and they all came to town to get this inheritance. And so um, there's this little, there's always in the fortunes, there's something that goes through the series. And this time it's that inheritance. And um, it was a, a lost relative that sent in the inheritance. 
And these particular cousins had their father had been banished from town or their grandfather had been banished from town, um, had left town because they say he caused a or they didn't. He blamed someone for causing a mining incident that had happened, you know, years and years ago and then left town with a bunch of money. So and so they were kind of like the black sheep of the family. And then they get this inheritance and they come back to town and, you know, lots and lots of emotional stuff. So it sounds so good. The cover is gorgeous. <laughs> I don't know. I thought it was out already. I kept checking the website. I went to Walmart like a couple of mornings in the row, like just making sure like, did I miss something? Is it not? I was like, oh, it hasn't come out yet. <laughs> Yeah, like, cannot wait to get my hands on this book because yeah, it sounds fun. like Asa and Lily, like they're friends. I was like, is, this is like friends to lovers, like fake relationship type deal because he has to like, I guess there's like a caveat, like whatever. Asa wants to, does he want to buy, buy a home? There's something yeah, so, he wants. So there's this ranch outside of town and he, um, he's one who was brought to town. He, his dad was one of the you know, bad guys. And one of the fortune, there were a couple of bad fortune brothers who were very selfish and caused a mining accident, took a whole bunch of money and ran and let somebody else take the the blame for the mining accident. So kind of backstory. So Asa has grown up, um, his, both of those brothers did not end up in good relationships and they had these kids who are cousins, um, but not good relationships. Right. So Asa is very much a loner and not, doesn't want anything to do with family because family has been nothing but bad news for him. And he left home young. He grew up in Texas, left home young to learn ranching. And uh, his whole dream is to own his own ranch. But he has a memory of when he was a child, his father took them to this small town and he did not know it was his family's town, but he remembers going there and it was a dude ranch and his father took them there for this vacation. And he always remembered that ranch. So when he has to come to town, the the inheritance came with caveats, right? And so Asa comes to town to get his inheritance and he sees that that ranch is for sale. And he wants to buy it. And so um, I don't want to give away too much, but there is a caveat for him buying the ranch. And and it is that he has to be married. And oh. it's, and so he can't, he wants this ranch so badly. Well, Lily, the last time Lily was with her sisters and her parents was on that ranch. So she has, you know, she has nothing really to hold on to of her family, except the fact that when she was a year and a half, she was in a stroller on this ranch and it was a happy family day and her mom and dad were so happy. And then that night they were killed in a car accident. Oh my goodness. Her parents were. So what Lily has always wanted is to be able to be on the ranch. She was hoping to get a job on the ranch. And so Asa he has to get married or he's going to lose his ranch and she will get to live on the ranch. And when the marriage is, is done, she can live in one of the cabins on the ranch if she wants to, or she'll have enough money, you know, cause Ace is giving her um, money from the ranch, you know, proceeds from the ranch because it's a dude ranch. It makes money. So he's going to, he shares some of that with her. So she'll have money to do whatever she wants to do with her life. Cause she's very, very poor. She works as a waitress in like a little cafe in like a Walmart in town. It's not Walmart because it's just a box store in town. It's a really small town and she's a, a waitress in the cafe. She's like 27, 28 years old and she's a waitress in the cafe. So she's going to be able, she never had money for college. She never had money for anything, you know? She lives in this tiny little one bedroom apartment in town above a store. And, you know, you well, you've shared so much of like what's coming next from you. I'm so excited for the Ocean Breeze series, um, Romantic Suspense. Do we have any upcoming titles oh. we should look forward to? Yeah, we have tons of romantic suspense. Sierra's Web. Um, and I'm writing, I just contracted two more Sierra's Web stories for romantic suspense. I just actually contracted five more books, but two more Sierra's um, Web stories for romantic suspense. Um, and they'll be coming out. I've got romantic, I've got Sierra's Web coming out all year. So I have, I think, nine books this year. Um, so we've got 
all the way through May and then August, October, November, and December of this year. Um, November special edition and the rest are romantic suspense and Sierra's web. So um, one that's, there are several of them that are coming up that, I mean, I just, I, I, of course I love all these books because they come from within me, but um, there's one called um, a high stakes reunion that's coming out. Um, I, it's, it's just one of those books, you know, it's set in the mountains and my mountains here in Arizona. And, um, I, I, it's just a good book. Um, another one, Deadly Mountain Red, um, Deadly Mountain Rescue that comes out in March of this year. Um, it's the one after the fortune. So, um, right now I have a new book out, um, just released this week with romantic suspense and it's a Colton. And it's the first book in the series. It's called Colton Threat Unleashed. And um, it takes place in Owl Creek. Um, it's a... Uh, it's, oh, it's uh, like the Coltons of Owl... Owls, Coltons of Owls, Owls, Owls Creek? Creek. Mm-hmm. That, okay, okay. Yeah, and it's... Um, it it's so far it's getting great reviews, which I'm really excited because it's the first book in the series. So you need to pull readers in, you know, so they want to see the rest of the books and the reviews have been fabulous. So I'm really excited about that. Um, but it's the story of a guy who owns um, a, a can it's not, I can't really say a kennel. He lives on like a, a ranch, except it's not a ranch. It, he raises dogs and he trains them. It's property like a ranch, but he has turned it into a training facility for service dogs. And he does um, all different kinds of service dogs and people like law enforcement from all around the country come to him to get his dogs. Um, He trains search and rescue. He does all kinds of service dogs and the, um, the kennels are being attacked. First, it just looks like sabotage, but his vet, who is the heroine, her name is Ruby. Um, She's there tending to a dog and then she is attacked. So so all these things start happening. And, um, and so he, you know, he's like, his name is Sebastian and he's trying to protect Ruby, protect his dogs, but he's also a vet with PTSD and Mm -hmm. nobody knows that. And he refuses to admit it to himself. He trains these service dogs and actually has a service dog of his own who has trained herself um, <laughs> because she's out there. She's you know? out there. Yeah. Oh, and, they're so smart. And, and her hero, her, her man, her, he, her, he needs her family member. He needs her. Yeah. And so um, he, he lives on his own, you know, because he just thinks he wants it that way. But in truth, it's that he doesn't trust himself because of PTSD episodes. And that's why he lives alone out, you know, in the country with his dogs. And this veterinarian, she's a Colton and she grew up in a huge family and all the chaos. And she just is very independent and wants to stay that way. And the two of them are thrown together while, you know, protecting the dogs and and each other and so you know you don't know who's doing this and that's kind of like that's the the suspense in the story is who's 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 vile enough to try and attack kennels and a veterinarian but anyway so well i think you definitely hooked people into the series because that's fantastic (laughs) well and then there's the whole baby thing so Mm -hmm. one night after a dog they thought a dog no dogs die in this i have to say you know i'm a a dog lover and the dogs are okay um the kennels are being attacked but um one night when a dog was in need of the vet and sebastian was really worried about the dog's life um, Ruby's there and it's a really, and Ruby's whole life is animals too. And they're, you know, it's a really, um, emotional time. And Sebastian actually starts to have a PTSD episode because this happened in the middle of the night. It was, it was an emergency. It was, you know, it was a threat. And so 
Ruby's there with him and she doesn't know that it's PTSD, but her brother, who is Sebastian's best friend, had gone into the military with him. And her brother very clearly has PTSD issues. And so Ruby is helping Sebastian and they end up making love. They've been friends forever and they just end up making love. That was before the book started. You hear about it in the first scene of the book because Ruby's coming back to take care, you know, to check on that dog. And Sebastian is sitting there thinking about the fact, you know, it's been weeks since that happened. They've both brushed it under like they've never spoken of it, brushed it under like it didn't happen. And Sebastian just needs to make sure that, they, you know, they're they're just not their best friendship anymore. It's like they've brushed it under the rug and yet there's this wall between them and he doesn't want the wall. Plus, he's kind of worried that maybe the wall's there because she saw his episode and he just wants to set things straight with them, which with her, which he does. But then Ruby, in the very beginning of the book, discovers that she's pregnant from that night. Oh my gosh. So there you go. (laughs) That's a lot. Oh, it sounds so good. So yeah, I love that one too. (laughs) It's like, I've always been an introvert through high school. I had one or two friends, never dated, never went on a single date in high school. I just read my romances and did my schoolwork, you know? Um, In my senior year in high school, I was also in college. So, I mean, I was very, very busy, but writing and reading and, you know, I've always lived with my people, but, you know, I never feel lonely because I have so many people all the time. All the time. Yeah. And I love them all. Yeah. And it just goes back to your your tweet of write something you believe in. If you don't believe it, your reader won't either. And just to hear how excited you are about these characters that have come to you. It's just like, these are why it's this is why it's always a good book. This is why it's always a good read. So, well, and the other thing about it is I totally believe that bone deep, bone deep live my life by the belief that love conquers all. Mm -hmm. And that's why Harlequin spoke to me when I was 14. You know, I've had, I've had a lot, a lot of struggles in my life and, um, things, not all good things have happened. And I always come out on top because I go to the heart and I trust and I know that love conquers all. Yeah. And so with these books, you know, people, a lot of people through my whole career, I've had people, oh, you write those books. Or some readers are afraid to pick up a romance because there's this stigma that you're reading those books. And what they don't, I mean, not only is this the largest by far selling genre in fiction, um, it, you know, and hugely successful, but it's because of what the books are putting into the world, which is love. And they reinstill that belief that love conquers all. And it really does. I mean, relationships are not all flowers and roses. There are always struggles in relationships. But if you can keep the love as a focus, if when you're angry, you can think about, take a minute and think about how much you love that person. Love really does conquer all. It really does. So I get to live my life with people discovering that love conquers all yes. and putting it out into the world for other people. And it's a real thing. It's, it's not those books. It's like the most powerful thing in the world. Yeah. So it, it's, it definitely um, inspires hope. I think your books, because I know, you know, having chatted with you before, I know that that's a belief of yours and it just really shines through. And it's, it's like, regardless of what you're going through, there is, that there, there, there is that, (laughs) you know, and you may not have it right now, but there is always hope. There's always hope. And every day you can focus on the bad that's facing you because everybody has something. Um, even if it's just that you have to do something at work, you don't really want to do today, or, you know, do something really horrible. You can focus on that, or you can get up and give yourself permission to look for something good that, you can do that day, even if it's just eat a brownie, you know, something that, but you focus on eating that brownie rather than focusing on, and it's all it's, and then your brain, you know, if you're not thinking about it, you're not feeling the residuals of it either. A little different if you're in, in physical pain, but even in physical pain, if you're thinking about something that feels good, that good feeling mingles there with the physical pain. Yeah. So you know, it's, it's all about controlling, controlling your choices. Yeah. Choose, choose to look for the good. Choose to look for the good. Oh, I love that. 
Um, where can everyone keep up with you online? Do you have a newsletter that's coming out? Where Plug all your things. Okay. So uh, just going to my website, taratetherquinn.com, you can, you, you can find me every place just from that front page. Um, I'm everywhere on socials and, you know, Facebook and Instagram and um, I'm on threads, not doing so much with that yet. Um, um, Pinterest, TikTok, I'm everywhere. And there are places to follow me on all of those on my website. I don't think TikTok yet, but if you go on TikTok, you can just find me there um, with my name. Um, and then at the bottom of the front page of my uh, website is a place to click to join my newsletter. Um, this year, I'm really excited about the newsletter in that um, there are 12 of us Harlequin authors who have gotten together. We all have um, books that we can give away free. And so we are trading off. So each month of my newsletter, I'm going to be giving away for free to every single reader. Um, no, nothing attached. You don't have to follow anything or join anything. Just click and it's free. Um, another Harlequin author's book. So they're not books that are published by Harlequin. They're books that Harlequin authors have written and published that they're giving away for free. So, so every single month this year, my newsletter is going to feature a different Harlequin author and a free book for everybody who subscribes to my newsletter. Only you, you don't have to subscribe to get the free book, but you have to get my newsletter to get the link. To, so I guess you kind of you kind of do have to subscribe. But I'm saying. From my newsletter, you just click. You don't have to join anyone else's newsletter. You don't have to follow anyone. You just click and read. So, um, so yeah, I'm excited about that. Well, thank you for that. I will have all of that listed below. I think newsletters are just so fun. So <laughs> I will make sure that it is linked below. And okay. thank you for joining me today. This was amazing. I loved being able to catch up with you. I always love talking to you too. It, it just feels good, doesn't it?